Hello, and welcome to the Turn by Turn podcast. This week, we are talking with Jorge, the creator of Mana Finder. I was able to play the demo for this one and really enjoyed it. Just like our last interview with Sam, this game also has a playable dog. We hope you enjoy our conversation with Jorge. Hello, everyone. Today, we are joined with Jorge to talk about his game, Mana Finder. How are you doing today? Uh, Pretty good. Yeah, it's pretty gloomy here in Seattle, but still doing pretty good. We're excited to have you because your game looks so cool. I always forget to say this, but Chris is here as well. Hi. (laughs) Hi, Chris. (laughs) Now that I've started editing these, I'm realizing, yeah, I've never even said he was here. So if you're listening, you don't realize until he starts talking. So Ah, that's all right. As usual. <laughs> but um, so, Jorge, tell us a little about yourself. Sure. Yeah. I'm uh, a software engineer by day, uh, indie dev by night. So, yeah, the classic case of moonlighting. Um, yeah. And I'm, uh, I guess, like you could say, a JRPG enthusiast, any RPG really. But uh, I'm really into JRPGs to the point where I decided to make one myself. And is, is this the first game that you've developed? Commercially, yes. But as a hobby, I've been doing uh, RPG Maker games since what was it like uh, since 2001. So it's been 20 years now. Wow. But uh, back then, you know, they were games that I did in junior high. So they had a lot of toilet humor and a lot of characters from all the franchises you can imagine. And I never published them online, but uh, I shared them with my friends at school and, and they liked it, liked them, or at least they said so. So that was enough to inspire me to, you know, keep making games. Mm-hmm. Then college and work and life got in the way. And then eventually, uh, not that I hate my work or anything, it's just that I needed like a creative outlet. And I mean, games are what got me into software engineering. So I felt like it was time to, you know, go back to, to my own roots. That's why I decided to start making a game, uh, mostly as a um, expression more than, you know, more than anything. It's art. Yes. Uh, what made you want to do like a commercial game instead of just making ones for your friends? So first of all, um, you know, I've grown up. Uh, so just making funny games for the sake of local humor and all that wasn't enough. I felt like I needed a, a challenge. I felt like I've consumed enough media in my life to, uh, you know, now want me to create something to give back to this wonderful community of RPGs and JRPGs and, and gaming in general. It's something I'm passionate about. I felt like it was time to challenge myself and also, as I said, uh, you know, offer something to so anyone can enjoy it. Very cool. So. Um... Your game is called Mana Finder. Um, mm-hmm. What's Mana Finder about? So, <laughs> what is it not about? Uh, <laughs> yeah, so Mana Finder is, uh, you know, it's about uh, survival. In, if I had to put it in one word, but it's also about re exploring mankind's relationship with uh, nature. And that's basically through, through the lenses of what it means to survive. And uh, more specifically, uh, Mana Finder takes place in a world called Aebi. This is a, a, like a floating continent. Um, it's a small world, and it's a world where man is equal to beast. Um, there's no like superiority. Well, not that there is here, I guess. I mean that uh, it's a very hostile world, and man is just like any other animal. Uh, it struggles to survive every day except for the one kingdom of Mana Hill, where King Bikar has managed to keep civilization thriving thanks to the power of the Mana Stones. Um, So the catch in this utopia is that he has zero tolerance for any type of crime. So, you know, he's like the uh, typical tyrant, has gone tired and apathetic over, you know, after ruling for... Uh, over a thousand years to the point where he all his trials he basically doesn't care what the crime is he just exiles people from mana hill and that's what uh in a way keeps him in power like that fear everyone has of the outside world is what uh makes people revere and you know be thankful for keeping them safe but it also got to the point where people just don't go out, have no need to go outside, and they don't even question what's out there. And that's where the journey starts, right? As an exile, you quickly realize that 
okay, we're missing out on a beautiful world, but yes, effectively, it's a uh, it's very hostile, and that's what the prologue is about. Um, pretty much setting up that world of there is this one kingdom where everything is nice and pretty, then there's this outside world that is pretty as well and very untapped by mankind, but uh, they pretty much are just like another animal, except for the one haven of survivors, uh, a small settlement, which is where Lambda, our protagonist, uh, finds herself in. In this settlement, they manage to survive by uh, collecting mana stones. And these mana stones are stones that literally have mana within them, and they are spread out throughout the whole world of Ivy. Now, since the world is very hostile, uh, collecting these stones themselves is a very dangerous task, right? So that's what mana finders uh, do. They risk their lives going into the outside world to collect these mana stones and bring them back to the settlement. Uh, and the settlement powers up uh, a barrier with this collected mana. So there's this cycle of uh, the mana finders go find mana stones to keep the settlement safe. But many mana finders uh, die on the mission or just, I mean, think about how do you go out into the world and find a stone, right? It's like, uh, as they say, finding a needle in a haystack. So it's like, a, it's a very uh, what's the word? Uh, tough mission. Uh, and some argue within the settlement itself that it's futile to keep doing this. So besides the difficulty of the mission and some mysterious characters threatening the safety of the settlement and internal tensions between what is the right thing to do, uh, basically time is running out for this settlement. And you, Lambda, uh, have to go out and collect the stones while at the same time try to figure out how to define the future for these people. Yeah, if you watch uh, our latest trailer, I guess that's what I try to describe, like uh, that uh, choice-making aspect of Mana Finder, where on the one hand, you are struggling to even survive, but on the other hand, you have to make tough choices to define the future of these uh, survivors. So with uh, the choice element, are there different endings depending on how you decide to go? Yes. Not only different endings, but the final chapter is completely different based on... There's two possible uh, paths, and it depends on the choices you make throughout the game. And, and your, your Steam page shows that this is not a huge time commitment either. It says 8 to 12 hours of playtime. Correct. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's... Uh, honestly, that wasn't... Uh, like, a Mana Finder, when I created the concept of it, it was a very concise idea. It was not about, uh, you know, the typical JRPG that uh, you spend 40 hours traveling around the world doing things. Also, given my resources uh, and budget, I went for a more concise uh, adventure. And 12 hours was more than enough for the story I wanted to tell. It also hopefully brings in more people, uh, since I know that for many, especially you know, people with uh, no not that much free time can also uh, give it a chance. Yeah, and uh, if you do have more free time, I think 8 to 12 hours is definitely, if I know there's two paths and two endings, like, I would, if I was enjoying it, 8 to 12 hours is not a big ask for me to see both endings. But uh, another thing, though, is that I did add a considerable amount of side quests, and ah. these can add up to your playtime but they are completely optional. And I didn't want to make uh, like, you know, uh, just fetch quests. Uh, these side quests delve deeper into the lives of the exile survivors. And as you progress through the story, uh, as you advance, there's five chapters in the game. And basically as you move on each chapter, you unlock like the next part of the of these uh, sub stories or side quests. And I mean, some of them are also, to be honest, the excuse to add mini games and you know other adventures to spice up the gameplay and you know give the player a break that sounds fun and now i'm super curious as to like uh, i don't want you to spoil it here but i'm very curious now to play it and see what kind of mini games and other things you threw in there mm -hmm. yeah on the latest trailer i give like a small hint of what you can expect 
I, I have a couple of guesses, but what, what games inspire, are inspired by this? Uh, I have some guesses as well as to what <laughs> games inspired this. There's many, you know. Um, obviously, uh, pretty much you can say any JRPG like Final Fantasy and yes, Breath of Fire. Yes, the whole multiple endings was greatly inspired by the Shin Megami Tensei series. Although this is not a modern urban setting, uh, it's that element was definitely inspired by that. But uh, I feel like I bring a lot of. It's definitely inspired by games, but uh, I grab many pieces from many. Oh wait, and of course the battle perspective is inspired by uh, Fantasy Star. That that was gonna be my guess <laughs> right there. I mean that, yeah. Um, but it looks really, really good. Like it looks like a refreshing take on that. Um, thank you. And it also the, the some of the character art reminded me of Fantasy Star a little bit. Yeah, definitely going after the 16-bit era look. But it's also not like uh, some games really uh, constrain themselves to strictly 16-bit aesthetic. <laughs> and this is more like uh, inspired by. Um, it's not a strictly a 16-bit era game. And the same thing can be said about many elements from games about the era. Um, but if you're expecting like uh, exactly another Final Fantasy, this is... Not it, right? It it brings elements from many games. And uh, for example, to cite specific examples, um, on Final Fantasy XII, I don't know if you guys played that one, um, you go out like uh, on very, very long treks uh, before like in between towns or, uh, you know, story points. And I don't know, that struck out with me. Like I really like that like long journey aspect. And that's something that I wanted to, to bring back and... It really meshed with the whole hostile world thing where there's pretty much no civilization. So when you go out seeking mana stones, you go out on these really long treks. You're like pretty much alone uh, with with a companion dog. <laughs> and that aspect of loneliness is something that I also wanted to, to bring in, which is a bit atypical of the genre, I know. But uh, I don't know, it's something that I... I love from some games like uh, Dark Souls, Metroid, you know, it gives that element of danger, but at the same time, I find some comfort in that, uh, you know, I'm here on my own, in this beautiful world. It's both exciting and, and dangerous. Are there a, a lot of like playable characters? Uh, just Lambda and your dog, uh, Scar. Uh, and there are assists. Uh, a few assists throughout the game, but they are not strictly speaking playable characters. Um, this was also a conscious decision. Um, I know some people have asked me um, they're not uh, like huge into not having a lot of characters, but uh, it's because uh, if you play Mana Finder, you'll see that there's a heavy emphasis on weapon selection during combat and exploiting enemy vulnerabilities. So making it be like a pretty much a single party member game allowed me to, first of all, tell the story I wanted to tell. Secondly, balance out. Uh, it's much easier to balance, uh, you know, the battles and the enemies and all the stat distribution and enemy strategies. Most importantly, it adds an element of, of strategy and it emphasizes this survival aspect that I'm going for. That is, uh, it's not just about you know, attacking the enemy to win. You have to pay attention to use the right weapon, uh, heal yourself, uh, defend, or other mechanics. Um, so it's a, it's not a game where you can expect to just press attack to win. The game is just so beautiful to look at. I love I'm like naturally inclined to pixel art anyway, but this just looks so good. Thanks. Uh, the pixel art is actually done by fellow collaborators. Um, I'm just a game dev. Um, I can also link you their, uh, you know, profiles and everything. But it's uh, for artists. Um, they are all very talented. They work also on other games, some of them. Um, and yeah, I'm really happy with their work too. Um, they also have put a lot of their own creative uh, energy into this project. Um, like sometimes when designing monsters, since I'm not an artist myself, I give them a description of what I'm, you know, imagining. And then they, since they're also like, you know, gamers themselves and they are really 
into all this uh, fantasy stuff as well. Um, I feel like they come up with pretty cool and creative designs that really match what what I was envisioning. Yeah, I noticed the colors too. Um, the color palette they end up using is very fantasy star to me and very, um, I need to learn better descriptors for colors because <laughs> I'm not sure how I would describe it. Not super bright, but it's it's like off, it's off colors that I don't normally see. Mm -hmm. Like it's not just blue, it's sort of an off blue that I'm like, oh, I, I don't see that show up very often in anything <laughs> yeah. but it looks really good here and it really pops and it, it leaves kind of a lasting impression and one more thing that they did and i'm not sure if you've seen from the screenshots or trailers but uh, there's also cutscenes uh while not animated they're like uh you know these pixel art vignettes and i'm really happy with those as well um they really i feel help bring the world into into life Mm -hmm. I did notice those and I thought they were very cool because you don't usually usually see the the 8 bit or 16 bit characters kind of waddling along the screen and like the text bubbles pop up versus actual like cutscene sort of idea. That's also something that uh, Fantasy Star 4 did a lot and that's another you know big inspiration. So um, do you have any anticipated release date? Well, since it's my first commercial game, all I can say is. 2022. Uh, I am content complete at this point, so I am confident that, uh, uh, like, like, in a very pre-alpha, pre-pre-pre-alpha uh, way, the game is playable from start to end. But uh, you know, uh, I need to do a lot more testing and polish, and that takes time. So that's why I don't want to say like a specific month on the next year. But all okay. I know is yeah. next year for sure I can do that and. Yeah, I'm very excited about this. We did. Who are we? Yeah, you know, we only ask. I've only so far reached out to people that whose games interest us, just because it's it's best for you, best for us to be talking about games that interest us. So it's more us being like, when can we play this, rather than mm -hmm. like set a date in stone and be tied to it. Yeah, we kind of know it's not a fair question. We just kind of want to have in our brains when we can start getting excited about it. <laughs> uh, yeah, and another thing is that. When considering these timelines, for example, there's a free demo available, by the way, that allowed me to get even more feedback. Uh, I wouldn't say that pushed back the release, but that did give me a lot of ideas on mostly quality of life features, like options to make the text faster, the animations faster. Performance mode was something that since I'm working on a desktop PC, then there's people playing on you know uh, some low-end laptops. That's when I realized that I hadn't... Uh, put much attention into the performance of the game. So with a demo, I was able to, to focus on that. But it's precisely those kind of things what I want to leave room for, even though I am, like I said, content complete at this point. So do you, um, are you going to be releasing on Steam or do you have like the bigger hopes of going to Switch or PS5 or any, anything really big? So Steam for sure. Uh, there's also itch, Itch.io. And I've applied to uh, GOG but uh, waiting on a response from them. Um, as for consoles, I really want to. Um, it's out of my you know, uh, budget and scope as a solo dev, but uh, I, I'm exploring options. And I'm in very, very early talks with a potential uh, publisher. So I cannot say yes yet, but mm -hmm. I'm hopeful that that will be the case. I, it's, it will be a dream come true for me. So yeah. It looks like a game you'd see it like released on Switch. Like yeah. it has that look about it for I play a lot on Switch myself, so <laughs> <laughs> I think Chris and I and anyone listening has probably put in too much time on Switch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so just so convenient. Um so is Steam the best place for people to find out more about your game or do you have a website that they could go to? Uh there's both the websites, uh, manafinder.com, but uh, yeah, Steam page is where I try to get the most traffic into, mostly because I want people to wishlist the game. Like anyone that wishes to help, uh, you know, this project, the best thing they can do right now is to to wishlist the game. It just helps a lot with the Steam algorithms and all that. 
especially when it comes to you know the, the release. Well, great. Well, um, we try to not keep people too long because we know everybody's really busy. Um, any last things to say about Mana Finder before we let you go? Uh, just uh, try out the demo. It's the first 90 minutes of the game. I'm pretty sure if you're into turn-based RPGs, you'll enjoy this. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Jorge. And maybe once the game's fully out, we'll play it and get you back on or j just do an episode on it. <laughs> that would be great. And thanks a lot for having me. Yeah, no problem. Thank, thank you. you. Yes, thanks, guys. And uh, we will be back with you all next week. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to our interview. If you like what you're hearing, please go give us a nice five-star rating and a subscription on Apple Podcasts. We want to keep the conversation going, so please reach out to us on Twitter at the Turn by Turn Pod or on Instagram at the Turn by Turn Podcast. We are available wherever podcasts are sold. Thank you so much, and we'll talk to you next week. Bye.